Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2018 OutNequal Global Webinar Series. The Global Webinar Series is a bi-monthly series of one-hour calls focused on LGBTQ workplace topics outside of the United States or on a global scale. My name is Ben Demers, and I'm the Global Initiatives Associate here at OutNequal. I'll be your host for today's call, on which we'll be discussing UN initiatives to engage the private sector in advancing LGBTQ equality around the, around the world, including in the workplace. This is a broadcast audio call, uh, meaning you can listen through the speakers on your computer, or if you're having difficulty with that, um, you can message in or call in at the numbers provided. Please be sure to send in questions um, as well using the chat function throughout the call. Uh, and at the end of the call, we'll have a Q&A period uh, where we'll facilitate those questions with our speakers. Um, also a reminder that a recording and slide deck will be made available afterwards for anyone who couldn't make the call, or if you'd like to listen again or share the slides with anyone else, uh, potentially at your company or your ERG. Um, as well, at the end of the call, we'll have a short survey just to get your feedback. Um, please fill that out. We always like to cater our feedback to our constituents' needs, um, so we really appreciate that. Also wanted to mention um, before we get started some other up and coming events here at Out and Equal. Um, with our webinar series, we have a virtual webinar series um, installment tomorrow, Get Sassy, Tapping the Power of Visible Allies at Work, which looks fantastic. Um, also for all of you who are already getting excited for the 2018 Workplace Summit, next week on March 22nd we have our kickoff call. So that really gives you all information for things you need to know as you start to plan for your 2018 summit experience. Uh, and then two months from now, we'll also be having our next global webinar series installment on corporate advocacy on global LGBTQ issues, which we're very excited for. For those of you who will be joining us in person, um, we also have the up and coming 2018 Executive Forum taking place in San Francisco from March 28th, 28th to 30th, uh, which provides leadership and development for um, LGBTQ professionals and allies. Um, and also on the night of March 29th, we will be having the Momentum Gala. Uh, which is a great place for everyone to get together and really celebrate our community while also um, awarding those who have really done fantastic work in the past year. Um, so before I actually introduce our speakers, I want to do a quick poll to get a, uh, to get a sense of where people are joining us on the call. Um, so if you want to type in where you're calling from, awesome, let's skip ahead to the results. Great, and so it looks like most of our callers are coming in from North America um, and also a pretty good sized group from Europe and also from East and Southeast Asia, which is great since we'll be talking um, today a bit about uh, a UN initiative in East and Southeast Asia as well. So great, I, I want to introduce our two speakers on today's call, um, joining us from two different UN agencies. So first we'll have Fabrice uh, Hodard, uh, a human rights officer at the office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, and he'll be talking a bit about the standards of business, uh, st standards of conduct for business um, regarding LGBTI issues around the world. Uh, and then we'll be hearing from Edmund Settle, the Regional Policy Advisor on HIV, Human Rights, Law, and Sexual Diversity with the United Nations Development Program based out of Bangkok. Um, yeah, so without further ado, let me hand it over to Fabrice to talk a bit about um, the standards of conduct for business. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. And, uh, and thank you very much to Out and Equal for uh, welcoming the United Nations. Uh, and also thank you very much to all the participants on the call today. Uh, so as, um, as Ben mentioned, we are uh, extremely honored to have the opportunity to present to you uh, the United Nations Global LGBTI Standard for Business. Um, so even though we have, we have made tremendous progress in the past 25 years, progress that as every participant on the call today know we actually were not able to, um, to predict uh, uh, 25 years ago, uh, we, we remain in a, in a, in a, in a pretty difficult situation. Uh, and, and part of it is the fact that progress has been uneven in the sense that it has particularly benefited mostly uh, lesbian and gay men in, uh, in certain parts of the world, uh, but it hasn't benefited uh, equally transgender and intersex people. But also besides that, we are definitely witnessing uh, some, kind of a, uh, some kind of a setback and also uh, increasing hate speech. Um, and you know, we just need to look at the news in the past few, uh, few weeks on what's happening in Indonesia, and maybe uh, Ed will refer to it, 
or even uh, or even the the rhetoric that is taking place uh, within many electoral campaigns in Latin America. Uh, I'm thinking about Nicaragua, Costa Rica, uh, places where uh, where we hear um, hate speech about LGBTI people. And then, you know, even though that graph is not particularly interesting, what it shows is that we had some momentum in decriminalizing homosexuality, which, which in a way, you know, criminalization of homosexuality is a huge impediment to the human rights of LGBTI people and the realization of the human rights of LGBTI people. And we were, you know, we can see what is interesting on that graph, of course, is to see how the colonial era was behind uh, most of the criminalization of homosexuality. Uh, but also what we can see on that graph is that the remaining countries that are criminalizing homosexuality uh, might be very hard to, uh, to tackle. Um, at the United Nations, we have an history of believing that the private sector can have a tremendous impact on, uh, on the human rights of LGBTI people. And so in particular, in 2000, uh, the United Nations, through the United Nations Global Compact, formulated the responsibilities of the private sector when it comes to human rights. And then more recently, in 2011, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights reiterated what are the responsibilities and opportunities for the private sector uh, on human rights. And, and, and basically what the United Nations Global Standards on LGBTI issues for business are is a translation of those two documents, the UN Global Compact and uh, the UN Guiding Principles when it comes to the human rights of LGBTI people. So when we looked at the, at the responsibilities and opportunities for the private sector when it comes to human rights of LGBTI people, we looked at its interaction with seven different stakeholders. And, and what we believe is that those stakeholders are, of course, shaping the way companies are dealing uh, with LGBTI uh, clients, customers, but also the overall LGBTI community. Uh, but companies can also have an influence on them. And, you know, there is a track record throughout the world in the past few years of the private sector playing an incredibly positive role uh, when it comes to shaping human rights of LGBTI people. So, of course, you know, most of the people on this call are aware of the coordinated approach that companies took in North Carolina to push back on uh, anti-transgender legislation, which were aimed at, um, at restricting the bathroom that transgender people could use. Uh, and even though it didn't have a direct impact on the legislation itself, what it did is that it deterred other states, other states to uh, implement similar legislation. And it also sent a very powerful signal that the private sector does believe that human rights of LGBTI people is relevant to their business. Previously, in 2012, when Uganda passed this abhorrent anti-homosexuality uh, law, private companies, including Virgin, City, Barclays, had uh, either behind closed door or in the public arena, um, a, a strong reaction in which they said, you know, to Uganda, it makes it difficult for us to do business. Similarly, when India reinstated uh, Section 377, which criminalized uh, homosexuality, a lot of Indian companies who courageously took ads in the newspapers uh, to express how, first of all, they stood up, they stood with LGBTI people, but also uh, send a strong signal that they were in favor of repealing Section 377, which criminalizes homosexuality. And then more recently, you know, as you know, a lot of um, companies, particularly American and Euro European companies, were sponsoring Pink Dot, which is the gay pride in Singapore, which is the equivalent of gay pride in Singapore. And, uh, and the government's reaction was to say that foreign companies could not sponsor the event anymore. And what happened is that actually a lot of local companies took up and they raised more money this year for Pink Dot uh, than in, in any previous years. So those are examples that send the message that when it comes to advocacy and global advocacy, the private sector can play a transformative, uh, transformative role. 
So something that we uh, that we expressed in the standout, and uh, you know, I sent I sent a link in the in the chat about where you can find the standout online and where you can download them. Um, even though we put the accent on the responsibilities and opportunities when it comes to human rights, and we frame LGBTI issues as a human rights issue, we also reiterated, of course, the famous economic and business case, which has never been so well articulated, and. Um, what it says is that there is dividend, of course, to stand up uh, for a more inclusive society when it comes to LGBTI issues. And uh, you can see here articulated some of those examples. Uh, and in particular, when I was at the World Bank uh, uh, for, uh, for a while, um, on, on the side of my job, I, uh, I, I worked on this study that showed that there is a tremendous economic impact um, in being uh, in being pro LGBTI, so I think you know before uh, I, I quickly present the standard itself, and I think you know I have to uh, I have to be a bit quick to leave uh, my colleague in uh, in uh, in Thailand some time to do his own presentation. You know, it's pretty important to know that the standard do not create new human rights obligation. In fact, you know the only thing that that is uh, that that we are saying is that human rights of LGBTI people should be respected. It does not create special rights for LGBTI people. And, you know, the standard, the language is extremely tough. And if there is one thing you could remember from this presentation is that the message of the United Nations to the private sector is an invitation to find their voice on human rights of LGBTI people. And it basically says you don't have to do everything everywhere. We understand that a lot of companies have operation in very hostile environments. But whenever you have the opportunity and in coordination with civil society, uh, you should contribute uh, to social change. So here is a slide that presents uh, the five uh, standards of conduct. As you can see, they are not, uh, they are not groundbreaking. Uh, you know, two of them are related to the workplace, in which you know, we are saying that, of course, the policies and procedures should not discriminate against LGBTI people, but it's not enough. Companies should also provide support, which means create an environment in which LGBTI people can benefit from those uh, policies and procedures. And that means you know, having employee resource group, having uh, business leaders that express support uh, to LGBTI people in the workplace. And then it talks about the marketplace and how companies are invited uh, to prevent other human rights violations in their relationship with partners, whether, whether it's um, with, whether it's suppliers, whether it's uh, uh, trade unions, um, companies can have an impact in the marketplace. And then, which, what is, in my opinion, the most ambitious, but also the most important standard, is that companies are invited to act in the public sphere, which is whenever they have the opportunity and in coordination with civil society, they should find ways to contribute to social change. Um, I'm going to skip on the example uh, that we have of concrete action that companies have and can take to fulfill uh, each of the standards. Um, but what I, will, what I will tell you is that actually today we have 76 companies, so three companies have joined in the past few days. Uh, and, and those companies are companies that have expressed support. And the, our request uh, to them of expressing support, which doesn't mean that they are committing to uh, implement each standard in each market. But what they're saying is that we are on this journey on human rights of LGBTI people. And as you can see, you know, those are a lot of big names. And what we are hoping is that it's sending a signal to the companies that have not yet started this journey, that, that the, the biggest players in their industry are taking this issue seriously and that they believe it is a human rights issue. Uh, so, you know, there is companies, uh, you know, there's a lot of Anglo-Saxon companies, but we also have, you know, uh, several French companies, German companies, Italian companies. We have two Indian companies, a Sri Lankan company, and a Colombian company. And, uh, and we are hoping to build a critical mass of companies that are saying those standards are important to us. Uh, so I'm going to run a, a very quick poll uh, to know whether uh, your, your company has adopted, uh, has adopted the standard or if uh, this is something that you are considering. Um, so here it is. I think I'm going to respond yes for the United Nations. <laughs> 
Um, great. Well, that that very, that very encouraging. Uh, and you know, I encourage any uh, any uh, person that is on the call today to inquire uh, to their corporate social responsibility, legal, and uh, human resources team to know whether this is something uh, that they are considering. Basically, what it means is that you're lending the cloud of your company uh, to the standard and saying this is an, an issue that is important to us. But you're also sending a powerful uh, message that you are among the early adopters uh, of the standard. Um, so, sorry about that. So, you know, I, I, will, uh, I will be pretty honest with you. We have had discussion with, uh, with a lot of companies. We do encounter, uh, strangely, uh, uh, resistance with some specific sectors. So far, we have not had one pharmaceutical company that has expressed support. And very often, the discussion that we have is that the, those pharmaceutical companies have, 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 gov have contracted directly with government in a style environment and believe that it could affect those contracts. Uh, I think this is being overly cautious. I don't really have ever seen you know, government uh, penalize a company for having uh, expressed support for human rights. Uh, but, but that's interesting. The extractive industry, of course, uh, is also uh, being very cautious. I think the reason is that they tend to have the most, uh, the most activities in, in countries that are, uh, that, are, that are hostile, but also they do not have uh, client-facing issues very often. And then finally, uh, consumer good companies with strong presence in, uh, in hostile environments have been a bit slow in adopting the standard. Uh, so that, you know, my last slide is, uh, is basically telling you what we have done. Besides having a critical mass of companies to express support for the standard, what we have done is that we have done launches throughout the world. Uh, in many places, uh, Mumbai, Melbourne, Nairobi, uh, New York, uh, London, Brussels, Paris, uh, Hong Kong, Bangkok, uh, and we are, we are launching them soon in Sao Paulo and Tokyo. And, and this is part of an effort to ensure it doesn't end up being another PDF file on the website of the United Nations, but that it really has an impact on, uh, on companies, particularly companies that do not believe it's relevant to their business, uh, which is still uh, a majority of companies in the world. Uh, but that also it pushes the private sector to contribute to social change. Uh, I recently wrote a piece that, that, called, that talked about the urgency uh, of social change on these issues. Um, we do not have 40 or 50 years to see decriminalization of homosexuality in Africa. We need to see this happen uh, much more quickly, and the private sector can play a tremendous role. So thank you so much uh, for taking the time to join us today. Uh, I'm going to send my, uh, my email address, and I am, uh, I am delighted to have any conversation with you guys offline. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to have a discussion with your company. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Fabrice. I mean, it's become clear in a lot of the conversations that we have at Out and Equal that a lot of companies do really want to engage globally on these issues uh, and don't always know where to start. So I think the great thing about these standards is that it starts to give people a place to start while also standardizing um, like those practices across companies. Um, so now we're going to switch over to a more regionally focused project with the United Nations Development Program called Being LGBTI in Asia. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Edmund Settle, uh, who is a policy advisor with the, um, with the UNDP. Uh, Edmund, over to you. Uh, thanks, Ben, um, and thanks uh, Out and Equal for for inviting us um, to to present today. Um, it's it's 11:30 here in Bangkok, so if I if I yawn in the middle of this, please uh, please excuse me. So my name is Edmund. Um, I'm with the UNDP, the Regional Policy Advisor here, based in Bangkok, and and one of the projects I oversee is a regional project um, called Be Being LGBT in Asia. Um, being LGBT as one of the one of the projects um, under being LGBT in Asia is around collecting data, and one of the studies that we did on on data collection it's around uh, access to employment and discrimination in the workplace in three different countries. And 
and so as this kind of following up, following up with what Fabrice said, um, the context of human rights in LGBT in Asia, there's challenges, there's persistent discrimination and violence, hostile legal and political environments, traditional social values, religious beliefs, cultural taboos um, can create barriers. There is invisibility of certain LGBT communities, transgender men, lesbian men, um, transgender men, lesbians, and intersex. Um, but also this, the concept of leaving no, no one behind, uh, intersecting vulnerabilities and socioeconomic costs of ex exclusion. But this being said, um, human rights of LGBT in Asia, I know we've um, talked a lot about the, the challenges and the, um, the legal barriers and policy barriers that exist. But what people probably don't know in this region over the past 10 years, over 25 countries have uh, pass protective legislation or issue protective court judgments um, for LGBT people. Um, and, so when we, and so when we talk about, um, uh, about the private sector being engaged in um, or, or protection of LGBTI people in this region, we have to keep this in mind. It's not always, um, it's not always going backwards. Um, that the trend is actually moving forward. If we refer back to Fabrice's slide over time, that things are getting better, but in some countries they are backslipping. Backsliding. The objectives of being LGBT in Asia. So it's, it's a multi-year program. It's supported by the government of Sweden, by the government of the United States, and also by a foundation in Hong Kong. It's really to strengthen the capacity of civil society, um, organizational capacity, but also the capacity to engage um, in advocacy and engage in research. Um, all the studies that we do on being LGBT in Asia, uh, one of the key partners is civil society. Um, another objective is to strengthen the capacity of government and human rights bodies. So engaging in multi-stakeholder multi dialogues with civil society, with academia, with the private sector, um, with strengthening the capacity of national human rights institutions to engage on SOGI issues or sexual orientation and gender identity, and also having building the capacity of these organizations and civil society to engage in human rights reporting mechanisms. This is, this is all critical, and this is all critical when it comes to engagement in the private sector as well, because access to employment, access to livelihoods comes up quite a bit. And the overall objective is to reduce stigma, stigma discrimination, and harmful practices. And private sector is a key partner in this area, because when we talk about, when we talk about access to education, access to employment, we're also looking about better health outcomes. We're looking at um, decreased um, evidence of violence, et cetera. Um, safe spaces in education, and also engaging the media, both the, um, the traditional media, but also new media. The, the Being LGBT in Asia, specifically, it's a partnership platform. Um, what, we, what we like to do is we, we built this platform and because we want to engage additional partners in this, in this program so we can have a bigger impact. Um, civil society, um, government, both national and local, the private sector, two of, our, two of our key partners in the private sector's field is The Economist um, and also Out and Equal. Academia and research bodies because we want to make sure the data produced in this program is actually owned by the countries where we do the studies at human rights bodies, national human rights institutions, but also journalists, editors, and publications. And as well as the UN is working as one. Um, so within this region, working with UNESCO, working with ILO, WHO, Office of High Commission of Human Rights, UN Women, and broader UNDP programs, including the Business and Human Rights Program. Okay, so for our first poll, um, if your company has operations in Asia, um, how far along is it um, in the LGBTQ um, diversity and inclusion work in the region? And so I'll give you a couple of seconds to answer that. Okay, great. Uh, a lot of you don't know. Okay, that's great. But um, not surprising because I think most of you are from the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so um, in initial stages, which is a good, it's good to see as well.
Okay, so some of the some of the highlights of being LGBT in Asia. Um, UNDP in the Asia is seen as a strategic partner. Um, it's it's relevant. Um, the program is actually designed in consultation of civil society and consultation of other, other stakeholders. It's efficient, so more bang for the buck. Um, and it's and we're helping to build a positive narrative. And their work is, our work is grounded in the sustainable development goals, and there's 17 of them. Um, so there's one on employment, there's one on equality, et cetera, et cetera. So um, going back to what um, Fabrice was talking about earlier, the sustainable development goals themselves are a key um, umbrella for this program. And then, as Fabrice mentioned earlier as well, some of the key principles of our program when we engage private sector is the UN prin guiding principles of business and human rights. Um, how these link to the SDGs, um, providing a living wage, so SDG 8 and 10, respect for human rights and due diligence to ensure freedom and fundamental freedoms are safeguarded, um, conduct robust envi environmental uh, impact assessments, develop and enforce anti-discrimination policies, um, invest in monitoring, auditing complaints um, out, out through their supply chain, and enhance grievance mechanisms and complaint mechanisms. And so these, these different items that we see here are, are nice entry points that, that the private sector can do when, when, we're, doing, when we're talking about LGBTI people. And again, um, I think Fabrice mentioned this earlier as well, is when we're talking about um, protecting the rights of LGBTI people within the private sector, we're not talking about specific special rights. What, what we want to do is we want to extend the protections that private sector have for women, have for disabilities, have for and, and, uh, minorities, extend those to LGBTI people. Okay, the study that we did um, over the past couple years, and what we were looking at is we're looking at LGBTI people, um, and we understand that they've continued to face stigma and discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression of sex characteristics. Um, we know discrimination uh, at work impacts their daily lives, um, we, both the individual level but also on a family level. At the, organization, at the organizational level, um, discrimination affects uh, workplace productivity and belonging, and at the societal level, co um, competitiveness. The methodology that we use, the study examined um, LGBTI, self-identified LGBTI people's experiences in the workplace um, throughout Asia. Um, well, primarily, well, excuse me, primarily through diff three different countries. So we looked at China, the Philippines, and Thailand. And the quantitative data, we, we've collected online surveys about, for about 1,500 people. And here's some of the data right here, and I'll just go past this. But you can see the age range from China, the Philippines, and Thailand. And so there's no surprise there, 18 to 35 is the primary, primary respondents, bachelor degrees, primary respondents. Um, Geographic location, it's mostly um, the urban areas and through in each different country. And what, what we found here, and this is not surprising, those LGBTI people who are more open about their SOGI status, so intersex variation in the workplace, um, seem to have um, public reported higher levels of discrimination at work. Um, if you look at the chart here, highlighted in yellow, and so here we ask the question, you know, have you been discriminated at, at work? And in China and Philippines and in Thailand, the percentages are 21, 29, and 23% um, respectively. But however, if you look at not sure down here, it's about the same um, for each country. But so what this actually implies is that most of the people that entered not sure were unaware what constitutes discrimination in the workplace. And so this has a, an implication for trainings and has implication for policy uh, moving forward. I'm sorry about that. Okay, here we go. Um, the data also shows those OHBTI people who have been sub subject to discrimination also reporting feeling less satisfied, about, less satisfied with their job and they're more likely to consider looking for another job. So the investments in your employees um, is, is wasted if, you, if your employees leave. But also, um, kind, of the, kind of sadly, what was also seen is that there's a leader recourse mechanism to be able to report any, any of this work. 
or any of these, any of these issues. Um, only, only about 30% of the respondents who experienced workplace discrimination, harassment, bullying actually reported the problem. Um, and the smaller number were satisfied with that. And what we, what we actually found is most of the companies um, that were, most of the employees that took their survey um, identified that their companies um, don't have a complaint mechanism or, or they don't know if their company's anti-discrimination policy actually applies uh, to them. Again, here we go. A few, uh, very few workplaces in Asia have LGBTI-inclusive policies in the workplace. Um, and again, going back, so we're not talking about specific LGBTI um, policies, um, but we're talking about policies that many of that already exist, um, but maybe could be strengthened by making it being more LGBTI-inclusive. And so some of the implications, um, economic lives of LGBTI people in Asia is relevant to organizations with different backgrounds in all locales. Um, so some of the studies the World Bank has shown, has, I mean, we've talked about the cost, economic cost of discrimination in different countries. Um, LGBTI people often experience, often experience a rather hostile workplace in Asia. Um, this goes in, in every country that we've um, actually been working in. This has been reported. Um, but now we're actually starting to collect the data with this. Um, being transgender um, is actually seen as, as, a, as, a, as a higher indicator for being discriminated at work. Um, people who are more, more masculine and more feminine. Um, and then being open that one soji at work into sex variation um, people reported multiple forms of workplace discrimination, some uh, fairly severe, severe either um, a physical um, violence or uh, sexual harassment. And it, again, an LGBTI and friendly workplace means LGBTI employees cannot bring the whole selves to work, and this has an impact on productivity and satisfaction. Some, some recommendations, the government and the private sector should develop and implement uh, formal, formal policies and dis dispute resolution mechanisms for non-discrimination equal treatment of LGBTI employees. Having, having LGBTI in policies is, is essential for, pre for preventing workplace discrimination. Um, what we've seen here is that companies who do trainings alone that don't have policies in place, um, those trainings are seen to be uh, less effective. Conversely, companies who have policies in place but don't have the trainings to back up those policies to inform uh, employees what those policies are um, to, to, to be able to um, inform employees what the redress mechanisms are, uh, those policies are, are seen as being ineffective as well. Okay, so th this is the main, the main um, results of the study. The study will be out most likely within, a, I'm hoping within the next four to six weeks. Uh, it's going through its final technical edit and copy editing and design. And then we will provide the link into um, Out and Equal to, to be able to share um, when, it's finally, when it's finally released. I'd like to acknowledge the um, professor from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, who is the lead researcher on this, uh, Professor Swen. Um, he's, he's been a great partner for UNDP and for LGBT um, research in this region. Um, Please keep connected with us. Um, our Facebook site at Being LGBT in Asia has over 75,000 followers. Um, keep in contact with the program, but also issues that are happening um, in uh, Asia right now in LGBT. Follow us on Twitter, um, and also um, our link to our website where everything is, um, all our documents and studies are posted. I'd like to thank Sweden, the USAID, and also the Faith and Love Foundation um, for Hong Kong for supporting um, uh, this program. Okay, and this is a great uh, rainbow UN flag that I found somewhere. All right, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Edmund. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, uh, being LGBTI in Asia really shows how important data is, I think, for making your argument uh, when talking to companies and when talking to government agencies. Um, it's so important to be able to point to data like this uh, to really make your case to really enact that change that you want to see. So that's it's such a fantastic initiative. Um, so I wanted to get to a lot of the questions that we've seen coming in from the audience, and please keep sending them in um, even as we're doing this Q&A period. And if there's any that we don't get to on the call, we'll make sure to connect you offline or to post them on our website. Um, so the first question actually is for, for Brees. 
Um, Fabrice, in spaces where even being LGBTQ is illegal, what are some ways in which companies can work to support their LGBTQ employees while still obviously staying within a legal framework and not endangering local activist efforts? And this is a, a question that we've seen a lot in Out Equal. Um, so, so if you uh, if you download the standard, uh, you know there is an entire part which is describing the standard themselves. But then there is uh, there is at the end a section on case study which shows best practice, some best practice that that companies have used, uh, particularly in difficult environment, right? Uh, but what is also important to remember is that is that you have to have a, a, a close look at what the legislation says. And you know, very often in most countries, the le legislation says that homosexual acts are illegal, but being LGBTI is not illegal. And therefore, companies can completely uh, transfer their diversity and inclusion policies from, uh, from their headquarters or from their uh, uh, from you know more uh, tolerant environment to more difficult environment without contravening the law, you know what what we feel is that very often uh, companies are actually uh, are actually being a little too quick in self censoring. I mean the legislation is usually is usually not forbidding to have uh, to have HR you know HR benefits that are equal. Uh, one example that I love to give is the example of IKEA, which actually is one of the supporters of the standard and, you know, a great company which is taking LGBTI inclusion extremely seriously. Uh, but, but activists often felt that when it was faced with a difficult situation in Russia, it removed an article about lesbians in its catalog in order to comply with the anti-gay propaganda legislation. Well, a lot of activists felt that there would have been other ways uh, to keep the article about lesbians while complying with the legislation. Uh, so, we, you know, we need to remember that most, most of the time you can actually have diversity and inclusion policies in the workplace, including, uh, you know, as an example, find ways to achieve, uh, I don't know, tax equality or uh, why not uh, contravening the law. Um, so, so I feel that what is important is to look very closely at what the law says. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Edmund, was there anything you wanted to add on that? No, I, I, I agree. Uh, I agree with Fabrice. Um, also, I think it's really important to, for, for companies that, that might have these questions um, if they have offices in, 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 in countries which are, have, have punitive environments, restrictive environments, is that these companies actually reach out to civil society that, that are there um, and actually um, discuss with them how far they can go. Um, civil society is probably the best barometer in each one of these countries um, to be able to, uh, to provide guidance and advice on, on how far companies can go to it, both internally but also externally and in in where they're working at. Um, so that would be my only recommendation there. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, Evan, the next question is for you. I apologize if you had mentioned this in your presentation, but how did the UNDP specifically choose Asia as the focus of this program? Yeah, so um, for UNDP, um, our regional office is based in Bangkok, and our region covers Afghanistan to the Pacific. So that's, that's our region. Um, and this program itself, being, being LGBT in Asia itself, it actually kind of grew out of our, our work around HIV, human rights, and the law. And most of that was related to men of sex with men um, and transgender women. Um, but as we started implementing, uh, as we were implementing these, uh, these HIV and human rights law programs, we noticed that um, the rest of the LGBT population, lesbians, trans men, intersex, um, weren't actually being, or non-identified gay men, um, weren't actually being covered by any programming and, and work related to, um, you know, access to education, access to employment access to health beyond HIV. And so what we did, we actually sat down with um, 
a couple of donors um, to basically say, how can we move beyond HIV specific and more into the human rights and development field um, when it comes to LGBTI. And so this actually happened in 2012, 2013. You, you, you remember when, um, when Hillary Clinton and President Obama basically said gay rights are human rights. Well, that just, um, that was a green light. Um, literally two weeks after that speech, um, we were meeting with donors and how do we create this program in this region? Um, and so that's how this, this program uh, started here in Asia, but uh, similar programs are now being implemented in, in Africa. Um, uh, in, in Africa, UNDP partners with OECHR, um, in the Caribbean, um, in English-speaking Caribbean, there's a program uh, being initiated right now, and we also implemented one in the, in the Balkan regions. And so the, you know, Asia, how we pick the different countries, how we pick the different regions, a lot of it is actually dependent on donors in this region as well. And so we have to, we have to kind of balance donor needs with um, community needs and with um, governments who want to work with us on this issue as well. Awesome. Um, the next question actually is for, for Brees, um, looking at the, so one of your slides had mentioned specifically resistance within pharmaceutical companies. Um, and the question is asking if this resistance specifically is related to LGBTQ issues um, from these companies or if it's a more general resistance to, uh, to UN business standards that you've noticed. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, well, that, that's a difficult question uh, because the pharmaceutical industry always faced uh, specific human rights issues, right? In particular, uh, the competition between profit and making drugs available to the poorest, uh, you know, trial in uh, in uh, in uh, in countries, um, in, in you know, in poorer countries, uh, the pharmaceutical industry does face a lot of specific uh, human rights challenge. As does the garment industry, you know, as as do a lot of uh, of industry. I mean, specifically. And that's why I think it's important for, for the participants on this call to consider whether they can have a discussion internally on, on, on their company expressing their support for the standard. The question is that also companies tend to look at each other. And they tend to look at, you know, is my competitor taking this issue, issue seriously? And something that we kind of noted at the beginning when we, when we decided to translate the UN Global Compact on the, on the topic of LGBTI issues is that in the world, a lot of companies continue to view it as a question of corporate culture or a question of tradition or a question of private life. They do not yet see it as a human rights issue as valid as, human trafficking, or child labor, or gender equality. And that's why having a company that say, we support this standard, you know, a big name, um, or a company that is respected in, in its industry, that say, we support this standard, is sending a very uh, pow powerful signal. So, you know, I, I'll be very honest, I have a discussion with Novartis, uh, Sanofi, uh, Merck, uh, Pfizer, those are companies that were involved from the beginning, you know, when we did the consultation on the standard, and they still have not expressed support. And th the reason is that sometimes there is a bit of cynicism on their part. They are like, what's in it for me? They don't have the same pressure of uh, having a good relationship with clients, you know, with millennial clients, as an example, or they don't have the same pressure to attract talent, or they don't have the same pressure to bolster their reputation, and they want to make sure that they continue to have very lucrative uh, contracts with governments, uh, you know, when it comes to vaccines or uh, when it comes to uh, to certain medications. Um, so I'll be I'll be frank. I have a problem with the pharmaceutical industry. I don't, you know, I I don't feel that they are pulling their weight uh, on this issue. Okay. The next question we have is um, from Warren asking, and I think both of you can speak to this. Do you have any tips with private sector ERGs uh, empowering teleworkers? since people who work from home are becoming a greater demographic um, in the technology industry. So have you seen uh, works to empower them to be either out in the workplace or just to be more engaged with corporate initiatives uh, that push LGBTQ inclusiveness? Go, go ahead, Fabrice. Um, well, I, I think that that's a, a very interesting question because the, the, the changes in the workforce of course, 
have a, has, has a tremendous impact on whether the, 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 the human rights of, of, of employees are respected, you know. So an, an interesting discussion I had, you know, I get a lot of support from the te- textile industry, right? So H&M, uh, Gap, uh, Ralph Lauren, um, and those are great companies. You know, a lot of them do not actually produce their garment. They have subcontractors in difficult environments uh, that, uh, that, uh, that produce the garment. And it's, it's extremely important for them to start to have a discussion with suppliers on whether these suppliers can take steps to respect the human rights of LGBTI people. Um, because even though those companies do not directly employ those workers, they clearly have a responsibility to ensure that the, the people that are making their garments are respecting human rights. And so I think that the same point of view when you look at teleworkers or when you look at you know, the increasing uh, number of contractors is how can you ensure that if your policies do not apply to them, their human rights are still respected. And you know, we can also think about companies like Uber or you know, Airbnb, how do you ensure that you have, uh, that you have policies in place uh, that that uh, that that make sure that your subcontractors are also respecting human rights. Uh, one good example that I have is Starbucks. You know, Starbucks has a pretty clear supplier uh, policy, and I have seen it having an impact on conservative brands, particularly a French conservative brand that I, I won't name, that wanted to keep their contract with Starbucks and therefore, you know, distance themselves from the French anti-LGBT movement. Uh, so I think it's important for companies, and that's the principle of standard four, to look a little bit beyond their own world. And, you know, mm-hmm. it, 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 it's not enough at this point in history to say, you know, within my world, I respect human rights. Companies have a responsibility in places where there is egregious violation of human rights to contribute to social change. Yeah, maybe if I can add on to that just a little bit. Um, so the the question about teleworkers, um, it's a very good question, uh, especially um, in this region in Asia as well. There's more and more telecommuting going on, um, the call center interest, industry. Um, you know, this might be something that organizations that like Out and Equal can look into. You know how you know how you know. How does Out and Equal um, it work? Um, how does Out and Equal reach employees that um, aren't in traditional workplace settings? That that, that might be something to look at. Um, the the issues around subcontractors and you know working with downstream partners and countries. Um, this has come up in many of our executive dialogues that we've had with the Economist in China and Vietnam, the Philippines, and Thailand, and we're going to have two more in India next month. Um, how do we um, influence our, our subcontractors, our downstream partners, to be able to extend those policies, extend those protections to LGBTI people. Um, and, and learning from the HIV world, this has been really difficult. Um, this has come up quite a bit in the HIV world where international companies try to influence their, their downstream partners, their subcontractors, to you know, non-discrimination to people living with HIV, providing HIV education within the workplace. And it was really difficult to do unless it's actually written into the contract. Um, if it's written into the contract, these certain protections will be provided for, for different vulnerable groups, uh, women, LGBTI people, indigenous people, people with disabilities, Unless those are written into the actual contracts um, at the beginning of that relationship, it's, it's really difficult to be able to change uh, behaviors, um, especially in some of the countries and some of the industries that Fabrice was talking about. Um, this, has been our, this has been my experience when, in the HIV world, and I see it playing out again um, here in the LGBT arena. Great, and thank you for that, um, that mention about Nico there. That's definitely a question, thinking as, as workers all over the world as the situation changes and more people go remote, both, um, both outside of the United States, but also in the U.S. and in Canada, um, how, we, how we still get companies to expend, or, sorry, extend um, their LGBTQ inclusive policies to those workers and make sure that they feel empowered, make sure that they feel safe um, is a really important question when you're not in the same physical space. And it's definitely something that we'll be looking more at, I think, in the coming years. Um, so another question actually for both of you is outside of the standards in being LGBTI in Asia, so the two initiatives that we've discussed today, 
what other ways can companies support UN initiatives uh, to, promote, to promote LGBTQ inclusion around the world? Um, so just also looking at other, other initiatives being started and just general support that companies can give. I think you both can definitely speak to that. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and take this one first, Fabrice. The, so a couple of things that, that companies can do, and again, I'm speaking from a, a regional perspective um, here in Asia, is you know, there's, there's kind of three areas that, that we're looking at. One is supporting uh, research initiatives, um, which um, companies, governments in this region, national companies and governments in this region, they, they, they respond to data you know, vis-a-vis -vis other countries and around the world. But in this region, they still respond to data. And if the data is actually developed, um, the research methodology and the data is actually developed with government partners, with n national labor associations, with communities in different countries, um, it's more likely to be able to have an impact on policy, both, both government policy and also uh, corporate policy. Um, there's a question I see here from Jen and Janice, Jen Janice Mohammed. Um, asking about um, including more countries in studies um, in Asia. And one of the limit, that's a good, very good question. And one of the limitations we have is actually resources. Um, resources to actually carry out these studies. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not cheap, um, but once the methodology is actually developed, it can be replicated in, in different countries. So there's, there's a few ways that um, companies can, you know, can support these efforts. One is research, producing data, um, companies, kind of have a convening power I've seen in, in countries like Vietnam and countries like China. They do have a convening power. They can bring civil society and government together. Um, one, of the, one of the areas that, um, that we've seen is a huge need um, is how do, how do companies actually translate their, their experiences on diversity and inclusion? How do they translate that into local context within this region? Um, so there, how, do, how do we translate those really good ERGs, how do we, how do we translate those, those non-discrimination policies which are inclusive of LGBTI people, how do we translate that into an Asian context or even to a country and local context? And, and, there's, and there's, um, there, there's work that can be done around that. And I think there's an openness to, for, for, for companies in this region, which many are, are now becoming multinational companies that, that we know of. Um, there's, there is openness to be able to learn from that. And the, probably, the, probably the third one is, you know, sub, there's a lot of youth innovation initiatives that are, that are going around in this region and other regions, bringing young people together. Um, a lot of companies support these youth and innovation um, initiatives, these, these entrepreneurial um, social innovation initiatives, um, making sure that these programs, which many of them are already being supported by companies that are probably on this call, making sure those are actually inclusive of LGBTI people making sure those, those programs actually make space for and actually recruit uh, young people to be able to participate in these youth innovation forums, youth entrepreneurship forums. And so these are kind of three ways that, um, that companies can also, you know, maybe not, uh, Fabrice, let Fabrice maybe talk about internal, um, but these are externally, this is how some companies can support external efforts that are, that are many of them are actually already ongoing. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Ed. I mean, uh, you know, one thing that I'm, I was pitching is the free and equal campaign, uh, you know, because, you know, I, I, I spoke about the standard, but the standard is actually not the bulk of the work of my office on this issue. The yeah. bulk of the work is a campaign called free and equal, and, um, and that campaign is an awareness campaign uh, on the human rights of LGBTI people. And it has been very successful. It has reached billions of people, and we have actually received a lot of support uh, from companies, some, uh, some support from H&M, some support from GAP. Uh, we have also gotten some pro bono um, input, you know, from, uh, from a, a wide variety of companies. So companies can definitely uh, play a role on these issues. I think, you know, beyond the standard and beyond the UN, uh, something that, that companies have to start thinking about or continue to think about is how to push a little bit the envelope on advocacy. And uh, I, I'm going to denounce. Uh, I'm going to denounce two companies today. Uh, I'm going to say, you know, Starbucks. Starbucks was under huge pressure in Indonesia uh, from a Muslim cleric uh, that was calling for a boycott. And what they did is that they, they 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 gave a press release in local language in which they say we do not stand for any ideology. 
that they were pretty quick to desolidarize themselves from LGBTI people. They could have said, you know, we are not pushing gay marriage in, uh, in Indonesia, but we stand up for the human rights of all people. They didn't say that. They say we do not stand for any ideology. Yet, Starbucks is reaping the benefits of being pro-LGBTI in uh, the Anglo-Saxon world and in part of Europe. Then similarly, uh, Google, which you know, I love and is one of the signatory of the standard, uh, recently was asked by the Indonesian government to remove 73 apps from its uh, marketplace, and it did uh, immediately. You know, one of the things that you could think is how, you know, it did, in my opinion, it didn't have much choice, but, in, but on the other way, how can it contribute to advocacy for respect? of human rights of LGBTI people. I think one of the issues that we have and we need to think about, and Out on Equal is very well placed for that, is to think about what mechanisms can we have when there is an assault on the human rights of LGBTI people, like the one that is taking place in Indonesia, so that the private sector can play a positive role in coordination with civil society uh, without exposing itself too much. Uh, but, you know, I think it, there is a risk true risk of companies positioning themselves as LGBTI champions in the United States, in the United Kingdom, where today it pays off, and not doing the hard work of pushing a little bit the envelope in the more difficult places. Great, okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so Joanne asked, what can we do as private citizens, and I think this is a question that a lot of us have, what can we do as private citizens to only support organizations that have strong human rights policies? Um, because there is so much bad news about firms with harassment um, occurring in, in the firm and other bad practices, and it's hard to keep track of what companies you can really, um, what companies you can really trust to buy from, especially when a lot of those companies are buying from other companies also, and so you have to be aware of, of that chain. Um, what best way can you inform yourself independently as not only somebody who's pushing LGBTQ diversity and inclusion at your company, but also as an individual consumer? Um, how can you best stay aware? Do either of you have anything to uh, answer on that? Yeah, I, I love that question. I love that question. You know, I uh, often, you know, when I meet with students that come to the UN and they say, what can we do on human rights? I say, you know, you can start by looking where you shop. I mean, you know, a lot of, uh, of the fast fashion industry has tremendous impact on landfills, it has tremendous impact on child labor, on uh, environmental uh, situation. So what I say is that as private citizens, there's actually a lot that we can do. There was a wonderful article in the New York Times a few, uh, a few days ago about how companies were quick to position themselves on the NRA uh, issue uh, related to gun control. And what it, the outcome is that, the conclusion is that companies are paying increasingly attention to what uh, their clients and their shareholders are expecting from them. So I think as consumers and as, uh, you know, as presence on social media, as uh, shareholders, we can continuously push the companies we are interacting with in asking them, what are you doing on this specific issue? Uh, when we launched the standards in, uh, in Melbourne, uh, my, my boss, the Deputy High Commissioner on Human Rights, uh, Kate Gilmore, said, with the privilege of making profit comes great responsibility. And, uh, you know, it's not a very popular thing to say, but I think it's an important thing to say, which is that companies do have responsibilities on human rights, and they have a tremendous potential uh, to contribute to social change. So as consumers and as stakeholders, we should continue to put pressure on them. And informed consumers. I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's what uh, the key point that you brought up, Fabrice. Um, I, don't have, I don't have anything additional to add to this, but I, I, want, I, want, I want to take one of these last questions, if, if, if it's okay, from Cal Jackson about yes, the question right. about Singapore. Yeah, so, um, so Cal Jackson asked, um, uh, there, his office in Singapore is asking about the Pink Dot celebration. Um, it's a flagship event um, for, for the region, um, and uh, how can the company participate in that? Um, if it's not a Singaporean-based company, um, I, I would advise that, you know, pretty much uh, don't try to get involved in the, um, in the, uh, in the celebration itself, um, because it would 
it, it could give a reason if, most, if, if many international companies try to be involved in pink dot celebration um, when the government has already said no companies can fund this it could be reason to you know put more pressure on um, and more regulations on that festival itself that being said um, the 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 regulation, Singapore regulation around Pink Dot is only for Pink Dot. It's not to support, it, it's, it's, it doesn't extend to supporting NGOs to do other work. Um, there's NGOs who work with young LGBTI people, especially those who are having problems coming out at school or having problems in the family, um, suicidal, et cetera, et cetera. And there is organizations who work with older LGBTI people. There's, there's service organizations who work on mental health and, and HIV issues. So um, beyond Pink Dot itself, um, there are a lot of opportunities where, where companies in Singapore can support civil society that are providing services and, and some advocacy services as well, but providing services to the LGBT community in, in Singapore. If, if you have offices in Hong Kong or in Taiwan, um, which are also starting a pink dot type celebration, um, the environment there is still open where companies can, you know, support um, those um, the initiatives, but also be um, visible as well. Um, but in Singapore, you know, there's, there is space to support LGBTI organizations um, in service delivery, um, but I would advise against at this point, advise against uh, trying to be involved in the Pink Dot. Great, thank you. Um, I know we're going over, so I know some of you probably have to go to make other meetings and such. Um, so I, I do apologize to have to wrap up so quickly, but I do want to thank everyone who's on the call and also thank you to Fabrice and Edmund, our two fantastic speakers. Um, for sharing about these two initiatives and just discussing the UN more generally. Uh, it gives a lot of standards for us to follow around the world, and I think it provides a really great example. Um, so yeah, so thank you to everybody. A few last minute shout outs. Um, keep in mind the virtual summit webinar uh, coming up tomorrow, and also our next global webinar on corporate advocacy on global LGBTQ issues, which is coming up in May. Um, for those of us who will see at the Executive Forum, see you at the end of this month. And also keep an eye out uh, for this week. We'll be more announcements about the 2018 Out and Equal Global Fellowship. Um, fantastic. Thank you all.